Welcome, everybody. It is April 2023. My name is Mike Truska. I am your host for the CarPGA Virtual Panels. I'm very excited about our guest today and our topics. Um, I wanted to uh, address a couple of things as we talk from housekeeping, um, and then we'll go right to our guest, who I'm very excited about. Uh, we are, for those of you who were able to catch any of the Wizards of the Coast stream, um, which was sort of a creator summit, which I think was exciting that it was being done. I've actually attended something like that years ago, um, but I wasn't able to be there personally, obviously, and I wasn't uh, there virtually, although we did cover it in my role in N-World. We, one of the uh, conversations that came up was around uh, car PG, not the car PG, but ro role playing streamers and their sort of ability to engage um, with Wizards as a brand. And sometimes that brand is, is positive and sometimes it's negative. And that can go for any streamer. Any streamer who knows this will know that there's good days and bad days. And they were really curious about how Wizards could support them from a, a mental health perspective. And I think this is a really interesting point because it brings up um, the a couple of challenges. One of them is that there's just a not enough information about the uh, mental health resources around the globe, um, one. And two, that... Uh, Solo streaming, podcasting, any kind of creator is very much, uh, although it is by its nature, a social and networked uh, organization and it's, it's dealing with the internet, it can be a very lonely experience. So I thought the CarPJ, given there are many therapists and, and psychologists and folks better than me who are more educated than me on this topic, I think we might be able to help even if it's just updating our page. So that's a question I will put to the group. I'm gonna get better at how we ask. I think maybe we'll do a survey or something in, in our LinkedIn group and our Facebook page. So we, you can give us feedback a little bit more directly, but I'd love to ha get your recommendations. I can't do this alone. Um, and I think we can really help. I think that that was certainly a cry for help um, that was sort of unfortunately taken in some cases negatively uh, and it shouldn't be. I think uh, that's a, it's an easy lift for some folks that certainly CarPJ is probably better positioned than some other organizations to help, so I'd love to help. But speaking of talking about uh, creators and, and their influencers, I'm very excited to welcome our latest member. I'm gonna get him on the screen so we can see him and guest, Michael Lowe. Welcome, Michael Lowe. You are Hi. now a member of the family. Wow, um, I, so, uh, I, I didn't know I was signing up for blood relations. Yeah, you pretty or, much, uh, yeah. Or found family relations. I, I'll, I'll get to know the extended network as we go. <laughs> Hi, how are you going? I, I love to have you here. I'm very excited. Um, you. This is, uh, you were recommended by our board, which we're excited about. So we love your work. Um, and you. that's really huge to hear. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, I've now seen your stuff and absolutely love it, but uh, the board uh, absolutely recommended it and right and deservedly so. Um, so, which we will make clear in a minute. But uh, thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate you doing this. Um, I, I, I was joking with Michael earlier, which is that obviously he knows how to do this. So he probably, he could run this. Maybe you just interview me. I mean, if you want. So <laughs> do you want to tell me about your history in gaming? My, no. Michael's they, in a room. So, I know. You know. It'll probably get a little tiresome. But, but anyway, yeah. And the other thing is people have heard me a lot. So mm -hmm. uh, it's good to hear from you. Um, no, so... I'll try to be as interesting as I can be. Uh, no, no promises. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Don't worry. No expectations. I'm sure it'll be right fine. On, right um, but uh, what we usually start with when we, we do these interviews is really just to understand sort of the journey uh, mm. for you to get to here, right? So we'll, we'll get to what here is, but we'd love to hear sort of your game. It's always fascinating to hear uh, how folks get from, you know, the first experience with role playing. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. you have involvement with kids, which we'll talk about. Um, so that experience and then coming to sort of this full fledged, um, uh, your, your, all the various business this opportunities thing that you have. You do. Yeah. yeah I don't know what this, to call it. The, yeah. the multi tentacled, uh, takeover of, wow. um, all, of the world. So, uh, anywhere you want to start, let us know. What do you think? Um, okay. Well, if you want the gaming history, I don't know. We can go with the really old school one, like sure. 11 year old. Yeah. So, start yeah. there. Yeah. I think uh, I first learned a game at 11 from a buddy of mine named Sean, who is now an amazing artist in Chicago, and he's still my dream collab on a future project for Games for Kids, because <laughs> his stuff is absolutely amazing. You can go look him up, and thank you for flying.com. He did uh, a series called Brobots that I'm in love with, but at 11, wow. I could draw as well as he could. Um, we proved this with a draw off. But he introduced <laughs> me to... Um, to, I think we played AD&D at first. And mm -hmm. what was interesting is we quickly started playing all the Palladium games. So my my high school was like TMNT, Mutants in Avalon, uh, a bunch of like, you know, and then we got into GURPS and we, you know, we played, we played a bunch of stuff and 
some white wolf we really never played a lot of D. &D. Mm -hmm. um i feel like in the 90s it kind of wasn't there yeah um and it yeah. kind of came back after i i sort of moved out of gaming circles for a while but yeah i was making games i think i started making games pretty much as soon as i realized you could do that so my senior project actually i remember got a good friend eric farmer who is actually a game maker in uh madison wisconsin and uh which is funny because you know it's been years and we're still yeah, right. we're still making games that's impressive but, um, well, I mean, I think it's formative and this is actually, you know, this will loop back around to when we talk about games and education, but anybody who's played a role-playing game knows that they are incredibly formative. You can have emotional experiences that are as close to real as you can get. The level of empathy you can develop and the level of sort of understanding of self is really exceptional for most leisure activities. I can't think of anything else that is that much compelling fun and transforms you. Um, as quickly so yeah i think it really got in deep but um yeah he and i made for our senior high school project we wrote a, a rather you know a rather elaborate game about pre prehistory um and prehistoric humans we had all the different uh you know anthrop uh, uh australopithecus robustus and wow. all the different hominids and the only point about it that i'm proud of is we had gradual successes in that game. And that was 97. So that was before wow, anybody else yeah. did them. And we were 18 years old and we did that. And so now right. when I look back, every, anytime I need to like license myself and be like, <laughs> do I get to build games? Like, do I do I have any good ideas? I'm like, wait, you did gradual successes though. Nice. That was a thing you did. So uh, that's my little weird point of personal pride. But yeah, so since then, um, I really have never stopped making games. Um I, I've sort of made them constantly throughout my life, um, became a teacher, loved teaching, was always playing games with kids after school, running them in after school programs, and um, started, you know, a uh, pivot in, in the uh, pandemic where my kid, um, he's nine, he had a little crew and we were playing a homebrewed thing. And uh, when we went online, I looked for what was out there. And of course, all I found was D&D, &D, was fifth ed. So I said, okay, I'll run some fifth ed. Ultimately, as a parent and as an educator, um, I was doing uh, Minds of Pandelver, right? Because it's mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And as a parent and as, a, and as an educator, the storyline and the mechanics pushed narratives I didn't think were right um, and that I didn't feel right running for kids. There was a mm -hmm. lot of killing. There was a lot of othering, right? Oh, yeah, it's a posse of goblins. You can go kill them. Um, those are not messages I wanted. I, I don't know. I wouldn't think anybody really needs those messages. Like if you're having fun with those games later in life, that's cool. But as an educator, I didn't feel right running those stories for kids. It felt wrong in my, in my heart. And so I started building and rebuilding. And what I quickly came to was a collaborative world building Google slides based approach that very quickly became a writing program, which is really when I sort of face palmed and was like, wait a minute, I should have been doing this 20 years ago. Why was I not building uh, generative collaborative storytelling games? I know how much this compels kids to write and edit and get thoughtful and collaborate and build culture together and build trust and also build, you know, positive peer-based joy and celebration of skills like presentation, speaking and listening, writing, uh, editing, revision, all these amazing things that people struggle with in school and kids will do them endlessly when they are within the framework of a story game that belongs to them and centers on their agency and their story, the one they want to tell. I know the adventure you're talking about. I, you're not going to say it and I don't want you to say it, but I, there is a kid's adventure that was released and I remember going, it's people fighting a bunch of monsters in cages. What the heck, man? And well, I played it with my son mm -hmm. and he was young and he was like, I don't want to hurt it. You know what's interesting? I, I, I sometimes have this discussion with, with, uh, with folks who are sort of older school in their approach. And there's this, um, there's a reaction that people get. I run nonviolent games. And right. I, I center nonviolence in all of my settings. And right. somebody will be like, you, you'll get two responses. One will be, well, all kids want to kill stuff, though, don't they? Mm -hmm. and, and the other response is, well, you're just pandering to them. What about when you got to kill? Right. And to both of those, I'm like, that's interesting. Um, and I could have a lot of responses. I think one of the more shocking ones is, uh, would you play through uh, some scene that had sexual overtones? Right. 
Of course you wouldn't. How on earth would you play through a murder? Right. And treat it as though it is disposable and that that's perfectly reasonable as a response to solving problems. Mm -hmm. um, now, a lot of kids want to have power fantasies, but this is my second answer. My second answer is 11-year-old me. I remember playing AD&D for the first time with Sean Dove, and he had my character encounter a, a Balrog. And oh, boy. the thing, okay. yeah, I mean, he, he put me at some ridiculous level. It was like <laughs> level 14. He was, you know, we were kids. We were 11 yeah, right. years old. Yes. Yes. We didn't have any idea how the rules worked. We were just kind of doing stuff, which yep. is what, yep. you know, you had to really push to do that when you wanted to learn that system. So we did that. So, you know, and I counter this guy and I'm calling him sir and being utterly polite. And my friend is just kind of stunned. <laughs> He just keeps looking at me and going, aren't you going to like pull out your sword or like yell at him? I'm like, I don't know him, man. Like he could be cool. Like, I don't know. He could be going shopping. Like, I don't know this guy. I've found that, that the kids, far from what people would imagine, they use violence as an X card to remove elements of a story that make them emotionally uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason they do that is that's how it's framed narratively in a lot of the storytelling we do as adults. A lot of what they see on the screen is if you have a problem, it's personified. You can find it. It's a person. And then you hurt them. And then the problem's solved. Right. Um, which is exactly the opposite of the real what, what happens in the real world where everything's confusing and you struggle and you feel awkward a lot. And there's no easy answers. Right. And in fact, if you get violent, it creates cycles of trauma rather than solving problems. Right. So, um, yeah, I found that kids really, you know, if you let them write their own stories, there's a lot of like going to Boba after school yeah, and like singing karaoke with their superhero characters right. and uh, building the prom and the battle of the bands and figuring out who's in that one sports team that's probably going to win. And are we going to take them on in that weird sport we made up? These right. are the things they want to tell stories about. Um but a lot of the classic games didn't allow them to tell those stories. So they weren't player centered. And as an educator, I, I don't teach unless it's student centered. Yeah. And I, it's always fascinating to see people introduce the games to their kids. And then they're mm -hmm. like, and, the, and my, my little kids, usually it's the little kids, the older kids, like you said, it's a little bit different, but the little kids yeah. and they say they don't want to hurt anything. And, the, and then they're like, well, what do I do? And you're like, that's the first, you're, you're almost there. <laughs> you're on the path. Yeah. But maybe that means you shouldn't have just used that game in that way. So um, so I, obviously that was a transformative moment, which was amazing. Right. So you, you you've it's it's Google Slides. It's kid oriented. It's generative. Now, it, was that luck of legends or I because I, we talk about so, there yeah. was a few things. How, how did we get okay. to where that Ooh. is? Bridge right. that gap for us. <laughs> let me do. Let me see if I can. Yeah. Is that possible? I don't let know. Let me see if I can go chronologically. I may have to get out my blue police box for this. Um, okay. Let me see if I can sequence this. So yeah, beginning of the pandemic, I developed the approach. I started teaching online, um, and that was happening while I was teaching online with my regular classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and it became a built-out program. Uh, I give feedback on seven different common core standards. It's qualitative, it's descriptive because I have a portfolio of work. And I, the thing that really shocked me was my approach was centering narrative. And there are mechanics and all the mechanics work, but they're all centered around building a good story rather than winning and losing in combat. Because mm -hmm. I, I often hear people you know, getting really excited about D&D &D or whatever game they love and they'll say, yeah, you know, I love this game. I'll say, great. Well, you know, it's a great game for what it does. It's kind of a war game. Say, it's not a war game. I play it this way. And I said, no, 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 no. That's the game you made. You're an awesome yeah. game designer and that's dope. But the game you're playing that got you, the game that you're actually, you know, the game that got you there, it's built to with very clear directives in mind. Everything on your character sheet tells you this game is about hurting stuff right. and not getting hurt. All your abilities center around combat. Skills are almost a, you know, it's almost a, a side thought in the majority. It's a, it's based on a war game and that's cool. Right. If you want to play the minis war game, that's dope. But yep. this story centered narrative. So I had kids writing hundreds of pages for fun. Wow. There's no grade attached. There's no requirement that you succeed. They were writing for each other and for themselves. Um, and any, any teacher will tell you that if you put kids in the driver's seat, all of us, you know, and this is true with every expert I know, we, we love the learning that we own. Mm -hmm. If you didn't build it, if you're not excited because you're like, look, I did this thing. Nobody else did this. This is me. 
I learned it. This is my PhD, my dissertation, my field of expertise. That's what you fall in love with. And the same is true, of course, at every age. So kids fell in love with the worlds they created and they started building their own novels. And that's when I started thinking, okay, how do I get this approach into other people's hands? Um, so the first pivot was starting to work with Daniel Hines of storiespodcast.com. Mm -hmm. And he and I uh, created a game together and that's what became Stories RPG. It was run by all my mechanics, but we you know, refined them, tweaked them a bit. And that ended up becoming a podcast, storiesrpg.com. And you can go out and find us wherever you find your, your favorite pods. Um, and that has play at home games for families that are literacy building. I couldn't do the entire approach because the entire approach requires a teacher's guide and it requires coaching. There's a, a number of different elements to the instructional process that are required on top of uh, learning to run the game. But Star Sworn was the first attempt to put this into the hands of people who were outside of gaming. That was a real key for me in design. I'm like, story games are amazing. Everybody should play them. What are the elements that you would need to introduce somebody who was completely new to the hobby without scaring them away? So we accessed a couple different design approaches, uh, laid out the book like a choose your own adventure with coloring book illustrations. Very friendly, very familiar. It's play to learn. So literally read the page, do the things, turn the page. Um, and each of these would go along with a chapter in an ongoing podcast where the podcast characters occasionally intersect with the uh, players in the story. Um, so that was our first big Kickstarter and that's been ongoing. We're now in Giga City Guardians, which is a whole new arc set in, a, in the superheroic world of Giga City. And um, that also led to my appearance at South by Southwest and... Um, the work I'm doing on classroom ready RPGs so that some folks who are out there teaching can can get all the goods. <laughs> this is not a small effort. <laughs> I, I love how you're just like jumping through and you're like, okay, I listen to that podcast. That's not like a two one person just like, you know, uh, let's just put when you say podcast, okay. My wife is a professional podcaster. We are launching yes. our own podcast. I want right, to right, right. pause to emphasize the level of effort. In this podcast, there's sound effects. There's a multiple cast. You are there's the game is going on. You have the apparatus around it, which is massive, right? Because that's planning, right? This is not you going. Let's just do a pot. You know, um, this is a level of this is a next level thing. So, oh, thank you. Kudos and truly, I appreciate the effort that goes into it, um, well, wanna, which is enormous. I want to pause to say this is not. I am not a master sound editor. Um, I am not a genius pod producer. That's all Daniel Hines. Stories Podcast is one of the top 10 kids podcasts in the world. Deservedly so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I think his stuff is amazing. I mean, like I said, um, I when I met him, it was on a one-page uh, TTRPG jam. And he posted a little one-pager that was based on Rysis. And he was like, hey, would anybody out there, this is, this is made for kids. Anybody out there want to give me some feedback? And I was <laughs> like, I work with kids. I'll give you some feedback. And we started hitting each, up on, each other up on Discord. And he goes... Yeah, so like, you know, I'm making this one page. I'm like, I give them all this targeted advice. I'm like, listen, you're you're making a mistake here. If you make it a penalty, kids won't play into the failure. You mm -hmm. want them to appreciate failure. You know, we're going through all this stuff. So what do you do for a living? And he goes, oh, I run this podcast. And, you know, I'm like, oh, cool. That's cool. What podcast? Stories <laughs> podcast. And oh, my wife, you know. <laughs> my wife died laughing because I came running into the other room. <laughs> and she and my son were in the bed. They were getting ready for bed. And I was like online. And I'm like, oh, I just talked with Daniel Hines. And Sage looks at me and he goes, Stories podcast? And I'm like, yeah. And then we sang Dog King, which is the whole song. And then I ran back. Uh... Yeah, he's the one who put this all together. He is lovely. All of our voice actors are paid. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the sound editing is done by Andrew, who's an old time, um, he's this like long time collaborator. So I can, I can claim none of the uh, the the kudos for the the show, other than just showing up and being the storyteller. Well, and that's huge. Oh, like and writing what, the game that goes with. Exactly, that's the that superhero is. team uh, is only as good as the the, the <laughs> podcast team, and I know. Uh, I know it takes it takes a village. So that's you're assembling the right superheroes for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean the pay, so to your point, like not just the podcast, but I, we can't let that pass because it is amazing. But then there's also a really comprehensive approach, right? So it's, a lot of this is meant, which I think is 
so necessary. I'm, <laughs> the world's changing. We're all going to pretend that COVID, I guess, didn't happen anymore. That's the, that's the year. That I guess we all pretend it's that's not a here. That's whole other conversation. <laughs> right. Mm. But um, it, it's interesting because I think the world we live in, uh, the world you were living in at that time that I was there too, yeah. uh, was very much that you were like, I don't know how much we can say, go do this with so-and-so. I think you really need to make it a self-serve where people can sort of build the world and you know the experience themselves it was clear yes. because of the game the podcast it really is so modular mm -hmm. um that you can sort of just take it so is the audience parents kids with parents what was sort of the thinking in how you rolled that out which part the podcast the game both well they the, they go uh, together the in an ecosystem so are they all meant to be different pieces or like what's your feeling on how you would present that and, and what's the audience um I think it's just a lot of different ways to make this accessible to people wherever they can access it. So mm -hmm. stories podcast, it's got a huge audience. There are all these kids out there who are already in love with stories. They already want to tell their own stories. Story play is interesting to them. And the podcast is on while their parent is in the room doing something else and turned the podcast on. So if you can get a, a really good, AP pod that is storytelling, funny, engaging for that family, you can help those parents bridge that gap and learn to play with their kids in a way that is deeply satisfying for them and creative for them, in addition to bonding and helping their kids learn all sorts of amazing things. I mean, I, I will say my son now is writing 10 pages a week wow. uh, for his games that he's in that you know, he wants to be in, like, I don't know, he doesn't have to be in my games. I have to save him a seat because he's like, I want a seat in Wednesday. And like, and he would, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, he was six and he would write maybe a sentence. Right. And now he's got plot arcs, dialogue, deep description. Um, So the approach is meant to be accessible. Once you've got the podcast in somebody's ear, well, there's a game you can download and you can print it. It's a PDF. And it's not going to require you to prep anything. It's absolutely zero prep. Grab the book, grab a couple six sided dice because we know you don't have those weird polyhedral ones at your house <laughs> and do what it says on page one. Go turn to the back, grab the character sheet, draw a picture of the character you want to play. Write a couple of intuitive sentences about that character. Here's some, here's some sample ones in case you want to like, you know, get some ideas. Here's a couple sample characters in case you just want to grab one and go. Okay, read this out loud. All right, you're in the scene. Here are some questions you might ask. Here are some things you might describe. So there was a, a an intentional matching of the pod and the game for families. Um, moving forward, I'm really excited about bringing this to teachers. Um, I have two collaborative teachers, uh, Tom and Tyler. They're currently playtesting Luna Uni, which is my stories RPG approach for the classroom. Just kickstarted it. Um, Kickstarter's still up. You can follow along, and I'll I'll ping you when we release the pdf yes PDF. definitely um it it's got three different layers there's a playable pdf just like every stories rpg game there is a uh a game that is online all the digital tools you need to run a storytelling game for kids uh online and really it works with anybody it doesn't matter your age um and then the third part is there's a teacher's guide with lesson plans pacing guides rubrics assessment guidelines, all the standards connections that you need. And Tyler and Tom have been running this for two months now and their kids are absolutely destroying writing. They're in love with it. They're writing over breaks. Their parents are shocked. Um, and this is two guys who, and I did not know this before I started working with them. <laughs> they said they were running a D&D after school club. So I was like, oh, they're gamers. They're gonna, they're gamer teachers. I often describe gamer teachers as uh, swordsman chefs. <laughs> Hear me out on this one. Okay. All right. Go ahead. If you were to tell an average swordsman to cook a meal for 30 people with only their sword, mm -hmm. somebody would probably get hurt or it wouldn't taste very good. <laughs> and opposite, if you asked a master chef to prepare a meal for 30 only using a sword, mm -hmm. same problem. It would either not taste good or someone would get hurt. So gamer teachers are this unique overlap. There's a fair number of us out there, but you really have to be a master of both worlds to use any system that's out there right now, effectively right. in the classroom. You yep. can do light brushes, but there aren't a lot of games that are built for learning. Um, right. I'm thinking about Inspirials by Rich Oxenham, which is amazing. It teaches ASL, but it's not 
aligned to standards that are usually privileged in a K through 12 classroom, whether, you know, wherever you go, there's a number of standards you have to hit. And as a teacher, you can't justify instructional minutes unless you know exactly which standards you're, you're meeting. So right. this gives you all of those tools in one easy package. And Tyler and Tom have just been, I don't know, I've been blown away. They had, it turns out they'd never, they'd never played a role-playing game. And they'd never run one before. Huh. And they ran their first game ever live for 25th graders for two hours. <laughs> My game. And um, because I thought, you know, it turns out they had just started the DD after school club on a whim and they had never played before. And they didn't know anything about it. They were just like, let's try this out. Um, the fun part is now that they've been going for a month, their D&D after school club has started playing uh, Stories RPG full That's time. That's amazing. Because they, in their D&D combats, they'd be like, well, can we just talk to these people and find out what the story is? Like, this seems like a boring story. I don't want to sit here and wait to roll a die. Like, let's let's talk about what's going to happen. Um, so I don't know. I, I felt like that was the biggest. I've been utterly delighted to work with them. They're amazing. So that's the next big move. We're going to try for an implementation and then an impact study next year. So I do need more play testers because uh, we're going to need a control group and we're going to need, you know, the folks who are doing the thing. And uh, if we can get the impact study, that will mean we're the only fully supported, uh, researched approach um, that is classroom ready. And hopefully we can start getting districts interested and start helping lots of people teach this way because it works. That's fantastic. Well, the CarPJ is definitely the sweet spot for this. We have teachers among us for sure. So yes. you're talking to the right audience. That's exciting. Yeah. And I see it just, I think I knew this and then totally whiffed on this, that it was April 6th. So you literally just, yeah, like just finished, right? I actually have a, I just had an <laughs> interview come out with Tyler and Tom on Ludagogy. Uh, if you know mm -hmm. Sarah Lefebvre, she's amazing. She's in the UK. She does uh, applied tabletop gaming um, for learning purposes. Mm -hmm. She's got an amazing Kickstarter called the Museum of Impossible Objects, which has amazing educational implications. These wonderful tarot-sized cards with a mysterious looking object and you flip it and it gives you a few ethical questions about this item that's stored in the Impossible Museum, the Museum wow. of Impossible Objects. But right. they all connect to social studies, ethics, history. Right. Um, the sciences it's all great and it it opens lots of doors for storytelling but um we were on her podcast and that just came out yesterday i want to say excellent so yeah we're we're still stumping give us the <laughs> link for sure so we'll share oh, yeah. that with the members so i mean look you i i i think you probably live and breathe what intuitively kids like um we know we're not getting there Right. We know I, I think this is we're at a pivot point of generational. There's a couple things that happen, right? You have uh, gamers getting older and they have kids and they're like, oh, play this thing. And then they're like, oh, that's been 20 years. And now it's different. And I'm like oh, trying by the to way, watch Goonies with right? a bunch of 10 year olds. Now the kids are like, why? Yes. And you're like, no, it was different when I watched it the first time. Like, no, it wasn't. We you were different. Like there is Ghostbusters is not the way we remember. We were I like, love, that's a man, different the new the new Ghostbusters was so good. It was great, was but we so wanted to good. show the kids the original, and we were like, I don't... You're like, wait. gosh, do I remember all the really rampant sexism right. and the sort of, like, really offensive, almost right. predatory stuff? Right, and you're gosh. like, whoa! No, I didn't notice as, you know, 10-year-old uh, me or whatever, because, you know, of course, there was no PG-13 back then, and you're like, nope. now... I don't know that I would. Show. So it was, it was we, there was a few conversations. We were like, we're going to have to talk about this and we're going to mm -hmm. have to wait maybe a little bit before we show it. So, I, but yeah. you know, that's RPGs, right? So the RPG yep. world, you're like, this is the thing I loved. And then you go, oh, wait a minute. So that's, you know, certainly <laughs> one part of it. The other part, the other factor, you mentioned the pandemic, mm -hmm. it sort of blown things open, right? So on the yep. one hand, a lot of the, you know, so <laughs> we went into school, you know, you go to your first day of class and yep. the parents were like, the, the teachers, Mm. we can't get them to talk. They mm. lost their social skills. They were like, it's really a problem. And they said, we're working on collaborative engagement. And again, of course, as adults, you're like, ah, we do, you know, whatever, right? So I'm completely remote in my role, but I certainly have talked to large groups and I regularly engage, but you don't realize in the formative years how much you could lose, like a good two years of that really can hurt right so i imagine there's a lot of that coming together yeah where no, you definitely. come in right <laughs> so michael you know, save I mean, us 
<laughs> oh, gosh. I mean, I don't think I'm, I'm that important by a long <laughs> shot, but there's a lot of great people doing work in education and RPGs. I think therapeutic uses have become very well established, but academic uses are sort of new. Um, yeah. And the way I explain it to folks who don't understand, first off, why it works, and second off, why it's why it's really sort of obvious. The first thing is school is already a game. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's just like like a lot of games. It's just very badly designed for the players. <laughs> um, it's not made for kids. Yeah. Uh, and kids are the ones who are playing. They offer arbitrary rewards that only tend to matter to adults. Mm -hmm. um, they don't create opportunities for kids to get the rewards they want, which is peer recognition. That's what kids want. They want to be celebrated. They want to feel safe. They want to feel part of a community. That's the top thing. Oxytocin and dopamine. They have twice as many receptors at the at all the way up through uh, the high school years than we do. There's a very solid reason that that really kids are motivated to do things like sports. If a kid has a formative experience in a sport where they're cheered by peers genuinely for something they did, mm -hmm. they will for the rest of their lives absolutely gravitate towards that sport. Same thing's true with gaming. That's how a lot of us got hooked. We had a formative experience where we cheered together, where we did something, we rolled something, we came up with an idea. And for months afterwards, you know, our peers are coming over and be like, dude, remember when you, <laughs> that's the mistake we make when we're thinking about gaming for kids right now, right? Is we assume that it's the content. There's also a corporate thing going on here. If you establish a world, you have IP and you can sell things. If you welcome people to build their own worlds, then you don't own that IP that they just mm -hmm. created and you can't mm -hmm. sell it or merchandise based off of it. Um, so uh, as an educator, I'm interested in generative RPGs. I'm inter interested in story games that put kids' voice first. Um, for educators, I always say like to me, stunning thing about another example of badly designed game for school. We start with personal narratives. Mm -hmm. Take a moment. I'm 44 as of April 7th. I am a 44-year-old man. And if you came to me today and said, I would like you to write me a thoughtful, nuanced, honest, vulnerable essay about <laughs> something that happened to you that shows who you are or how you changed and how you struggled. And I want you to do that so that I can then mark it up, judge it, and hand it back to you. I would absolutely never do that. The level of emotional skill and understanding and meta-analysis and vulnerability and, and sort of confidence in self that that requires is immense for someone at any age. And we ask nine, 10 year old kids to do this. Of course they don't want to. You wouldn't either. Mm -hmm. Right. So the wonderful thing about story games is give them a second self. I mean, all of us learn so much by occupying someone else in fiction, right? We mm -hmm. could experiment with self, which is exactly what you need to do at nine or 10 years old. You want to become different versions and you'll learn things, right? Oh gosh, actually I'm kind of funny. Or, well, you know what? I can be kind of like confident and strong and like, you know, stand up for myself sometimes. Only in that role as that character, because it gives you a level of safety. I didn't fail, the character did. I didn't right. do that, my character did. So you get to both occupy the avatar space of embodying a person who is not you and also the authorial space of being able to step back and sort of process, okay, how'd that go? How did I feel about that? Okay, what did I learn from that about what I wanna do next time or how I want the story to go? Um, from a literacy standpoint, you take a kid who's never had a, an immersive moment reading, right? They've never, the words have never fallen away enough for them to completely submerge in story when they're reading printed text, because they're still struggling with decoding or they haven't really gotten a rhythm. Their voice in their head hasn't really caught up with the speed of their eyes. Let them play a role-playing game and then write about their character. Let them build somewhere that the rest of the party will go to. So they know, yeah, I'm building this world that they're all gonna travel to. That's going to be the best possible motive. And it will give them that transformative experience of being the fictional self. And then translating that to, okay, now I can imagine the fictional self in the written word. It does a huge amount for literacy, social skills, uh, confidence building, and really one of the hardest things, you were talking about kids who can't talk, right, in class. You can't learn when you can't trust. 
Mm -hmm. If you're not safe in a room, you can't be vulnerable. And if you can't be vulnerable, you're not going to have a transformative learning experience. It can't happen. Um, the brilliant thing about games is they can put kids into these emotionally challenging situations. Um, and I'm thinking about some of the live scenes. I can talk a little bit about the classroom structure, but we're, they're split into lore sessions and live sessions. Live sessions is when you're playing the action. Lore sessions, you're editing, developing, asking each other questions, working on stuff. Um, but, you know, they have these moments in the live sessions where they are all on the edge of their seats. They're all deeply emotionally engaged and they fail. And then another kid has to save them. Don't worry, don't worry. I got two story points, re-roll it. In that moment, they have done what everyone needs to do to build trust, which is you have to, you have to trust somebody and then go through a moment where you need them to back you up and they have to come through. And that's what role-playing games do. So you can create classroom culture that's so deeply bonded that the kids are actually hanging out outside of school, online on the Google Slides doc, building more stories because they want to. Right. Nobody's told them to do it. You know, Tyler and Tom were telling me they've got parents calling over break or emailing and being like, hey, they're saying they want to do this writing thing online. Is that okay? <laughs> are they allowed to add more slides? And you know, Tyler and Tom are like, heck yeah. Like, yeah, hey, please. <laughs> and we've got second language learners. This is their first time in English and they're writing their first plot lines for in, in their first sentences in English are plot lines for Luna Uni. And then, you know, getting cheers from the rest of the room. We've got, you know, neurodivergent kids who have had absolute aversion to writing mm -hmm. because again, they've been asked to talk about self. And all of a sudden they're experimenting with and learning all these, these different ways of evincing character, right? Embodying character that allow them to experiment with how they feel. And now they're loving writing and used to cry. This is a kid who they've talked about a lot. Like this kid literally would cry and had altered their entire uh, schedule to minimize writing time. And wow. now this kid is begging for extended sessions and staying through lunch. So it works and it makes a huge difference. Um, and I'm just hoping I can get it into as many people's hands as possible. That's amazing. So what's the barrier? I mean, so part of the point I started to make too, which we were hitting on was I feel like mm -hmm. on the one hand, the pandemic blew things open, right? So people yeah. were like, you know what? I'm willing to consider anything because this is not working, right? So, you know, <laughs> I think those go. teachers are yeah. like, uh, you know, I can't even get them to speak. So yeah. I think that's part of it. But certainly, you know, we see this with gamification. We see it with, we were like the rise of, um, uh, of escape rooms. You know, there's mm -hmm. clearly something primal about yeah. this. Yep. that we crave that we've lost in some ways right and that children intuitively yet but they don't have they're not being encouraged to use it unfortunately you know, wait wait a minute i'm gonna say yes, it is go it is primal but like i like this you said we've kind of lost i'd say it was taken it's a little yeah. bit like baking bread or mm -hmm. windex <laughs> like hear yep. me out on this yep you don't need windex you need a little bit of white vinegar and some water and it cleans everything Yes. Windex is a creation. You don't know what's in Windex. It's blue. <laughs> it's what you need for glass. Bread, I got to buy it. It's all sliced for me. It's got to be hard. Like, I don't know. It's really easy. You don't even need to buy yeast. It's flour and water. The yeast comes in the flour. Like, you can build your starter. It's easy. People mm -hmm. are rediscovering what has been commodified and commercialized mm -hmm. and sort of removed from, you know, from modern life, right? Which is yeah. anything that, you know, if we can sell it to you, then you don't need, you don't have to do it yourself. Um, I am not a designer of products. I'm a designer of tools and experiences. I don't want to give you a thing. I want to give you something that lets you build stuff. Um, that's always been what I do. That's 20 years of teaching. You know, this is what I do. Um, if you want to have a great compelling classroom where people learn and they, they remember and they, they value what happened, one, put their voices in the center of it. Two, give them the tools to chase the things they find fascinating and compelling. If you can do those two things, they'll teach themselves. You just have Absolutely. to hold their hand and stand to the side and say, yeah, tell me what you need. And the thing that, and I know you know this, we know this. We know it. Okay. Tell me. We don't do it. No, I'm, I'm, oh, I, oh, yes, I think no. most teachers who work with kids know this, but we're not. So this is what I was going to get to. What is, yeah. the, why not? What is our, what is your number one obstacle to, because I think we moment, already, nothing. there's nothing to disagree with you, right? We're all like, yeah. yeah, of course. Yes. I know children. I know they love to tell stories. And so why would we not? And, and it's amazing to me because everybody will nod their heads 
right? Yeah. I have, I've had this conversation a few times. Everybody goes, yeah. absolutely. And then yeah. I go, I'll tell you what, my son was like, I was in global studies and it was like, uh, and by the end of it, you're yeah. like, meanwhile, there's another teacher who talks every day about the amazing current events and ties it right back to what he's talking about. Yeah. And he asked him to tell stories and you're like, okay, what's going on? Why are we, why is this so hard? Tell me, Michael, tell me why okay, it's so hard. So I'm going to say a couple of things. First yes. off, every good teacher is a good game designer. Mm -hmm. um, that's what they do. They design experiences. They're already doing it and they're running a game for a lot more people and the outcomes have to be a lot bigger than I had fun. Mm -hmm. So, you know, teachers are already incredible designers yeah. um, and they are also being pulled in about 400 different ways. They have to be therapists. They have mm -hmm. to be mentors and coaches. They have to be essentially CEOs of a company because they have to have a mission and vision, right? And they also have to be mid-level and micro managers of tasks. Now, add to all this, there are a host of standards that they are compelled to at least say that they're meeting. There are oftentimes, you know, depending on the school you're teaching at, you have to have an exit ticket for every single week. You have to have multiple graded assignments every single week. If I have 200 kids and I have to give them three graded assignments each a week, I'm going to tell you right now that I am not actually doing my job because when I file those, they're going to be box ticks. Mm -hmm. They can't be any kind of profound feedback to kids. And this is a thing. I always say grades should never be given unless they do three things. They give you specific, actionable, mm -hmm. and constructive feedback on how to build a skill. If it's not doing those three things, it's a judgment, it's a black box, and it tells kids they're bad at a thing without giving them room to figure out what to do next. Right. Now, teachers are trapped by that system. Um, and I've gotten to find out from this side of the fence. <laughs> I know so, you know, so. <laughs> I mean, I do. Uh, but yeah, from this side of the fence, I've learned some interesting new things. So I have an approach. It's brilliant. It works wonders, but it's anecdotal. I can give you a lot of parent reviews. Mm -hmm. I can give you kid reviews. I can show you the kids writing. I can show you the improvement that they've made on accessible standards on the rubrics I use. Now, here's one thing I can't do. I cannot give you implementation research that proves that there is impact to the work that I do. In order to do that, I need PhD education researchers. In order to get them, I need a grant. And then I also need enough play teachers to get a statistically significant sample. And these people need to all get paid for the research they do crunching the numbers. That's actually what I'm doing right now. But when you start to think about things like this as a barrier to getting a new strategy into teachers' hands so they can do stuff with it, you start to realize why uh, you know districts tend to buy things from huge companies. The answer is huge companies have the money and the manpower yeah. to do these things. They don't have to ask anyone. They don't have to go looking for grants. They just do it. And then they're able to say, see, we've got this research-driven approach. Does it mean it's the best approach? Not necessarily. There's probably a good 500 other approaches out there that teachers would love and might have much better impact for kids, but they're not being put into teachers' hands because there's all these barriers preventing these great ideas from getting shared. Um, it's also the reason a lot of innovation in teaching comes from the ground up. Teachers are really auteurs. <laughs> like they get real picky about their classroom, partly because it's their art. It's both an art and a craft. They're performing for kids. They're also cultivating kids. They're, they're helping kids figure out their paths. And they're also responsible for all these academic wins, right? So as a result, you know, they can be very, you know, the, the 40th time somebody comes to them and says, we got this great new thing. They're like, uh-huh. I've seen the last 400 PDs and I'll keep doing what works for me, thanks. Right. Which you can't blame them for doing. Right. So there's there's a little bit of, of stickiness at, there's a whole lot of stickiness at the, the, the system level. Mm -hmm. But what I found is there's a lot of teachers hungry for this sort of approach um, and really looking for it, which is super exciting. So right 100%. now, I think fewer fewer barriers than there once were. Yeah, and, and that's sort of the vibe I got, like I said, both from the pandemic that re clearly hurt in ways that I didn't even appreciate. Like, you know, you're always like, well, I don't see that with my kid. Now, first of all, I don't know if that's accurate because it's my kid, right? But also yeah. too, you're like, you know, my kid may not 
may have different skill sets. You know, we maybe do things differently. Yep. Um, you know, I've resources. seen resources totally different, you know, like so many kids suffered partly because we don't have, I mean, I said the pandemic's like any illness mm -hmm. when you get ill, it exposes the, the pre-existing conditions that you right. have. That's right. Same thing happened to our society. Uh, education system already had, you know, we have amazing social inequities, just un inconceivable ones. Um, and because of that, there's a lot of kids who don't have support. You know, I had kids during my teaching during the pandemic, I had a kid who was phoning in from cleaning pools with his uncle, but he would phone in. That was wow. the part that blew my mind. I told him, I said, listen, you got to stop, man. Go do the work. If you need to keep the lights on, go. Right. Um, when the pandemic hit, we closed down in uh, what, March of 2020. And uh, a bunch of other teachers and I got together and we were like, okay, look, take it as an opportunity. Let's blow up all the stuff that doesn't work in school. Mm -hmm. Kids don't wake up till 10 a.m. We've already shown circadian rhythms. They go from, from noon to midnight. So, hey, let's meet them where they are, have later in the day classes. Let's go smaller groups so we can actually see everybody's faces, but shorter classes. Let's do project-based learning and then, you know, touch base. We'll have one lecture a week, but then all these other. So we, we had all these ideas, went to admin. Admin was like, this sounds great. Just hold off because we don't know what the district's going to say. Uh -huh. And of <laughs> course, education law wasn't ready to adapt. And we were legally required to run, get this, used to love this. One of the reasons I taught at this school, 90 minute classes, which in person is amazing for any mm -hmm. LA instruction. Mm -hmm. 90 minute classes used to be everybody could do their writing and reading and an analysis together with 30 kids on Zoom. You wow. ask for a setup you know, those kids are having to be vulnerable in a way they don't at school. They couldn't put on school self as, as you know, as a barrier. They've got everything that happens in their life happening right behind them. Many of them, you know, their families are going through a really hard time, struggling to make ends meet. Uh, a lot of them are free, free child care because school was child care and their right. parents have to go to work. And feeding them, which we discovered too. That was one of the things we were like, where's all this food? Like, oh, by the way. There's a lot of people who they don't eat if they if they don't go to school, which was, you know, again, talk about revealing inequities, but sorry. Yo, we yeah. know. Yeah. We knew all along. Yeah. Like schools feed kids, schools help kids get clothed often, depending mm -hmm. on how, how funds are raised. There are so many different ways in which schools fill in all these social services that are not covered and are yeah. not are not something that we have a right to in our society. So there there are a lot of ways in which I think story game is really fixed online education for me. Yeah. And uh, ways in which, you know, online experiences and games became really compelling. Like I teach these classes and the kids always argue about who gets to be the host when I leave. These kids have never been in a room <laughs> together. Like they, but they are deep in a story together. They know each other inside and out. You get to know people during a game in a different way. Yeah. So they, yeah, they stay on for another two hours talking, writing slides, collaborating. And that's their time. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I could say more about it, but uh, I will. I will say that I think the time for games in the classroom has come. Um, I think people are open to it and excited by it. And uh, once we've got the research locked down, and there's a lot of people doing good work out there, um, once we've got the research locked down, you're going to see it blowing up. But it's all about creating approaches that are easy for teachers, easy for kids, and that are standards aligned and really quickly scaffold and build to academic mastery. I'm ready for the revolution. <laughs> right <laughs> on. Go. But, but I will say one of the things that's great about what you're talking about and I, and cause you like your enthusiasm is infectious for sure. I, I love it. But I will say you're also methodical. And so, you know, the levers we've got to push, right? Like to your point, <laughs> that perfect example of like, let's do this. Well, Okay, but we have to have research and standards in it, you know, so I think you you very clearly see the challenges ahead of you, um, which I appreciate because uh, I love an idealist, but man, I hate when they don't get where they want to go. So. Idealism, <laughs> idealism only works if you've got some steps you can take. Exactly. The cool part is I've been teaching long enough. Um, I mean, I've been designing curriculum and also virtual curriculum for years in my career. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's 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 really interesting thinking about what makes it easiest and most accessible and also most exciting for teachers mm -hmm. because teachers are, are just like kids. We're just like kids. 
If you walk me into a room and you're like, you know what we're going to do today? We're going to build a world and then we're going to create <laughs> characters and it's your world. And you know, I'm thinking, like, yeah. I'm yeah. Like, yeah. Like that same thing works with teachers. You got to talk to them. Like if they're not excited to do this, of course, they're not going to. It's extra energy and time and effort. So my goal is always make this as exciting and fun as it is for the kids, for the teachers, and make the tools just as immersively exciting and, and you know, inspirational. Because teachers, like I said, they're artists. They get, they want that inspiration of like, oh my gosh, like I never even thought about this mode for my art. Let's go. So I'm really excited to work on those nitty gritty bits right. that- that really do like I don't know. I could talk about some of them. Um, you never even asked me to screen share. I have all this stuff open. Like, <laughs> I'll show you some stuff. Let's go. Like I, I'm always ready. You're, but, you yeah. are far too entertaining to, to share any screens. I'm sorry. We, it's all you, Michael. We, we, this oh, is man. this is pure mainstream, Michael. I I love it. So look, um, this is this is so good. I do want to be sensitive to time, Please. but you're part of the CarPGA, so no, I don't always. Every once in a while, I feel like we're bullying people because they're not Carpe Diem. And we're like, how can we help you? Even though you didn't join us. No, you joined us. So you're a member. So give us some marching orders. What can we do? Ooh. And some of this you may think about. Maybe we'll come back with some you know, electronic links. But mm. we have teachers among us. We have therapists among us. We have scholars among us. What can we do? I saw, the teachers, it sounds like it's pretty obvious. But what if can we wanna, do to help? So if you want to teach with this system and this approach, I am looking for as big a cohort of folks who are willing to work with it as I can find. Mm -hmm. um, if, I don't care what age group you're with. We can adapt. Currently, I've been teaching all the way from six to 13, but it works. I mean, I run a game that is much the same uh, for adults. The mm -hmm. same system is in Hold Fast Station, which is a game designed for adults it's on the itch page. Mm -hmm. So if you would like to work with this system, if you're interested in learning more, please reach out, uh, email me. Okay. Uh, there's a million different ways to get a hold of me. You can DM me on Twitter, even though it's on fire. Um, <laughs> while while it's still seven. there, yeah. While, yeah. while it's, yeah, you know. Um, yeah. But so that would be wonderful. The second thing is um, any one of my Kickstarters, uh, the more support I get, the more people I get to pay. So mm -hmm. uh, for Luna Uni, I was really looking to get funding for my artist. And then also funding for a couple of readers who work with special ed uh, and also with um, with people who have second language learning issues. Because I want to make mm -hmm. sure that it is differentiated and it hits all the different groups that teachers, of course, need to serve. Mm -hmm. um, so any support for Kickstarters is great. Uh, it also helps me you know, keep the lights on. And Now, there's not any – I'm not missing this, right? The Luna Uni finished. Right? It did. The so next there's... one that will be coming up will be Giga City Guardians. So oh, the okay. arc of okay. the Stories RPG has an online PDF that goes with. Please check the podcast out. Um, it's all ages. I've sent it to a bunch of my friends who aren't gamers, and they're all like, this is really fun. Like, <laughs> this is actually interesting. I didn't think I could listen to you for like an hour straight. And I was like, thanks. <laughs> Thank you? Yeah. <laughs> um, but um. Please uh, listen to the podcast. Tell me what you think. Um, and please don't hesitate to reach out. Anybody out there who is interested in working with me, who has any thoughts about any of the ways in which games can be used in and out, the, out of the classroom for learning purposes, I really have, I mean, I, I, I can say honestly, nothing I have done has uh, is the result of my effort alone. I have been mm -hmm. so fortunate in the people that I have met. Um, wonderful people. I was at South by Southwest because of Chris Hopper who's an amazing uh, layout and, and accessibility uh, graphic designer who works with all sorts of amazing people. He brought that team together. Um, like I said, Stories RPG, the podcast, that's entirely because of Daniel Hines. Um, the more people I meet, the the more community can grow and, and I'm hoping to be helpful for other people. Um, got a game coming out real soon, the 25th, only five days from now. Um, it's uh, Wormlings. It's by a friend, uh, Colossus Games, and he had me write a couple adventures for that. So, Excellent. you know, there's a lot of people out there. I feel like if we were all better connected, yeah. there'd be a yeah. lot of moves we could make. That's right. Well, that's that's part of what we're trying to do here. So bring yeah. bring uh, both archive it. I mean, part of the Carpe purposes, these are moments in time, especially now. I said that, and I didn't, I didn't, when we started this, we didn't know the pandemic was coming. But um, it's a moment in time. Uh, you know, yep. we're going to look back on this and laugh and be like, remember Michael was trying to get data for, you know, 
um, while we're flying around in our jetpacks and uh, <laughs> hopefully yeah, right. everybody's learning from robots. But no, I'm joking. But um, I, I'm very <laughs> excited about that. And uh, so absolutely, we will we will definitely do that. Um, I, I'm going to try. You have so much. <laughs> I'm going to try and put it in a way. You know what I'll do? I can give you an easy one. Bio.link yeah. mm -hmm. backslash Michael Lowe. And the only problem there is you have to spell my name correctly. M-I-C-H-A-E-L-L-O-W. So there's two. There's two. There's two L's. Yeah. So we did. Yep. Yeah, I see it. Bio.link mm -hmm. backslash. And that has kind of all my stuff on it. Yep. And like it even has all the social feeds and you can find me on whatever social media Excellent. you find compelling. Um, so yeah, um, reach out. I'm always available and excited to talk. Excellent. So oh, if anybody um, has any schools who are interested in this approach or is doing homeschooling and would like to do some uh, some practice, um, I'd be down. Um, I'm really excited to expand this and get it in more people's hands for the research purposes, but also for development. We also have quite a few librarians. Oh, who I'm sure would love to, to participate. And they are bringing role-playing games to libraries. So this is a huge opportunity for their programs as well. I gave away a hundred digital cop, no, two, 200 digital copies of Star Sworn uh, mm -hmm. for the, from the last Kickstarter. And I'm looking, I'm already looking to do the same. Every one of my Kickstarters, I give away to educators and librarians because they need tools. And if you've got tools in their hand, they will use them, which is one of the many things that makes them amazing. Well, I can't top that. So we've got your, we're going to have your social. We're going to have your information. That's a good way to end it. I want to be sensitive to time, but do not go away because we'll just okay. stop recording. We're going to keep talking for a minute. Um, but I love this. This is fantastic. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I love your enthusiasm. Same I'm way. all in. Right <laughs> I don't know. Lead me, lead me to better, a better future, Michael, because we got to get there. <laughs> I, my thing is I am, uh, I am, a, um, I like to be a practical optimist. Um, I'm going to work on the things I know and the things I'm good at. And this is something that works. It's the right time. There's a lot of people who are down for it and there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm for it. And lucky me, I happen to be in the right place and I seem to keep meeting the right people. So I'm going to keep making moves. So, um, I'll keep you posted, but I'm oh, excited. I think we in know, the next couple of years, we're going to see it coming. We know where to find you now. So it's yeah. fine. We, we will absolutely be uh, helping and engaging, but thank you so much for joining. And we'll, we will definitely send out more info for all of our members. Thank you again.